Hands. Welcome, my name is Anna Maria, if you haven't met before. I am leading the Butter Community Project. Very excited to kickstart our seven series event called the Learning Playground for the month of June. And we are gathering experts, practitioners to talk about the practical applications of play. We talk about playfulness, creativity, which is applied to learning experience design, employee experience design, collaboration, workshop design, facilitation, all that good stuff. The session is being recorded, so I just want to get that out of the way. If keeping your cameras off is, uh, feels more comfortable for you, feel free to do that. And also, this is going to be a panel conversation, a fireside chat. We're going to kickstart um, the chat with a couple of questions, but it is your opportunity to ask any type of questions, curiosities, bringing use cases, case studies, examples, challenges to the conversation. Feel free to drop them in the chat throughout the session as, as soon as these insights are reaching you. And I will make sure to surface them for our experts today and keep an eye on the chat. All right. Now, thank you for stamping in your choice. We are talking about learning. We're exploring learning. And I am so, 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 so excited to bring in three amazing guests for us today. And let me just go ahead and spotlight David Gagnon. Hey, David, wiggle a finger to the camera, say hello. Hi, hi. David is the director of I, um, Field Day. You hear me? I unmuted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay, good. I, we hear you. Perfect. And Field Day is an educational research laboratory uh, at the Wisconsin Center for Education Research. Um, it is composed of a diverse team of educational researchers, software engineers, artists, storytellers, and the lab is focusing on the intersection of situated and social cultural learning theories with digital media, specifically video games, mobile technology, and mixed reality. How cool is that, David? Thanks for accepting a random invitation from a random person on LinkedIn on a random day and being with us here today. I'm excited to have you in the room. Um, anything else that you would like to add to this introduction? Yeah, I mean, it's an exciting work that I get to do. Um, the theme of playfulness is certainly welcome. Um, we try to run our team very playfully because we have a bunch of creatives. Um, mm -hmm. And to get, you know, the, we're going to build this kind of stuff. There's a certain level of like safety and trust that's required in our teams of writers and such. Um, I'm really fortunate to be in a position where, you know, I get to direct the studio as well as a research lab and kind of sit in between the two. Um, so I have a foot in both. And I'm also really fortunate that we get to make things that are used by, you know, millions and millions of kids across the country and across the world for that matter. So it feels like what we're doing is really having a call and response with the, you know, the community um, and doing it publicly and doing it for free and doing it in schools and breathing a little bit of fresh air into, uh, well, today, about 10,000 kids' lives. <laughs> we'll have at least 20 minutes of us saying, you can do it. You're awesome. Like, let's go deeper. The world is totally worth exploring. Um, so we do all that in, in the service of research as well. So um, we collect a lot of data about how people play our games, and we use that to build models of how thinking and learning take place. Mm -hmm. That sounds awesome. Can't wait to hear some of those insights and your lessons learned um, today, David. Thank you. All right, let me welcome Jennifer into the spotlight as well. Hey, Jennifer. Uh, thank you again for responding to my invitation. And uh, Jennifer is an award-winning applied game designer, a play-based toolkit maker and i hear the word toolkit and i'm like yes where are they uh, and a passionate founder of the play tools design she's on a mission to guide thought leaders and change makers in developing and launching captivating play-based tools through a co-creative approach she combines her knowledge of game mechanics design thinking and strategic consulting to craft unique and immersive learning solutions and i like the sound of that Thank you for being with us today. Jennifer, anything you'd like to add about you and your awesome work? Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Um, yes, I would love to add that I feel that it's been a bit of a interesting journey for me into this field through uh, having a mother who designed play-based tools and uh, she developed a game for helping her teach financial education. And that was when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, and I started doing workshop play test and prototyping. And th that was before I knew any of what these terms meant. And later on, I started developing my own tools and applied games based on topics that I was personally interested in. Um, I've made games on end of life planning, games about uh, emotional intelligence and uh, into my relationships. And having published a few of those games, I realized the same skill I wanted to actually help other people uh, develop tools. And so, yeah, I, I think it's nice to share the variety of background that we all come into this from. And yes, thank you for highlighting that. Uh, I absolutely love the mix of uh, practitioners, but also researchers. And uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. So for everyone in the room, um, any, any creativity, any, any, not creativity, um, curiosities that you have, that was the word, uh, feel free to already pop your questions in the chat. And we are also welcoming David Newman is with us, part of the panel. Hey, David. And if you don't know David yes, yet, he's a creativity alchemist, a facilitator, an educator, and a coach. Uh, and he inspires and unleashes creativity through his teaching, facilitation, and coaching. He also uses game-based um, learning to teach media history and also teaches creativity at the University of British Columbia. He's also the co-founder of Creativity Culture Labs, whose mission is to help organizations unleash creativity, empower innovation, and develop organizational cultures, enabling transformative change. David, a pleasure to have you with us. Anything you'd like to add to this introduction about yourself? Well, thank you for inviting me. And um, I, no, I'm, I, I don't think there's anything more to add at this point. So I'm also aware of the timer, which says we're out of time for this section. So back to you. Oh, I like that you're looking at the. You're, I like that you're looking at it. Just don't mind that. We're sometimes <laughs> ignoring the time. That, right? It's just you know we go with the flow here. Um, I've plotted your LinkedIn's in the chat for folks here to connect with you and keep on learning from from your work and the things you're you're learning out loud. Um, all right, now moving on to the panel, we've got plenty of time to deep dive into the questions, and I have Oba. A, let me see what I clicked here. Uh, I have a list of uh, just curiosities whenever I look at your profiles and thinking, what would I want to ask these smart folks? And my first, the first thing, the first question that I added on my list was um, play playfulness in learning. It's not something new and we haven't quite yet cracked it. We see that a lot of people in the room already experimenting with infusing learning design, facilitation workshops with play and playfulness. Um, but there are still a couple of uh, myths, misconceptions, false information rooming around. So I wonder what are some of these common misconceptions or myths about play and learning, specifically at that intersection that you've come across um, in your work or research so far? And I'll direct the question to David Gagnon to kick us off. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing that I think I get is, um, you know, I work with a lot of academics. We're doing topics like astrophysics or cryogenic engineering, <laughs> and we're making a game about it. And the thing that I find is the biggest misconception is that play is um, not rigorous, <laughs> that play isn't deep, that play isn't hard. And I find almost personal offense when I'll be working with people that'll say, oh, if we if we build a game, that'll be silly, that'll be fun, that'll you know keep them all engaged. And it's like, sure, but that's where like it gets interesting, is it at that point of caring, of being engaged, of being invested. And I think play is a you know one of the gateways there. Um, and I yeah, that that's the main thing. 
play as silly instead of play as productive. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. Anything to add, Jennifer or David Newman? What are some common things, myths, misconceptions you've came across? I, I think they're just the idea that um, learning is serious that mm. you go into these lecture theatres and there's 300 students and this is a serious enterprise. When in fact, um, play is a natural part of the learning process. If you look at, you know, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, what are they doing? You know, they're playing, but they're learning. But play is essential to the learning process. And that doesn't need to be any different for us as adults. Mm. Thank you. Jennifer, how about you? Yeah, I'm I'm even thinking like from the question itself, like the separation of play and learning as separate things, because mm. we're always learning when we play. And as designers, we get to decide on what do we want people to learn through the play experience. But yeah, for me, there yeah, the idea that they're separate. Um, I mean, I see it more as life is one big playground and mm -hmm. how we choose to play, how we choose to live through this life. And and yeah, so for me, it's very much integrated. Mm. I love that. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to pull a string that David Newman just mentioned because, uh, and, and also what you're mentioning, Jennifer, like why are they different? I guess because we didn't have much fun in school. I guess that's why it's different. Like learning wasn't very fun. And then, yeah, you enter those when at university and there those big amphitheaters full of hundreds of people and we're all facing the same direction and we have the stage on the stage and then, you know, hopefully we learn something from their wisdom and, that, and then that's that. So I guess there's... Um, there's, there are some shifts, especially from where you're standing, the type of work that you're bringing. You're probably at the forefront of the way we're changing education, uh, the way we are including play, playfulness games, and the way we learn. So I wonder, how, would, how, do you, how do you define what is playfulness in this context of learning and education? Or better said, if we would enter a classroom, it can be at school or university, where traditional teaching methods like we know and we've been used to and we've grew up with are replaced with playful methods maybe not replaced maybe infused with play playfulness games what would we see like what is different in that in that reality towards what are we moving to um, I, I already have a scenario in my head, uh, just this as you were asking that question. Um, I, I think it would shorten the gap of um, knowledge and, and implementation. I, I, the scenario in my head was uh, just now for, let's say, someone studying policymaking or political science or something that obviously have real impact in society where you are in school learning it more, what are the current laws and how might we make it better? But then without actually engaging or uh, in this case, mm -hmm. a role play scenario where you're either engaging with local citizen or you're even role playing, not just as the policymaker, but as um, a citizen or there's just, so many ways in which we could learn uh what is it what does this yeah the implementing what we learn actually mean and school now is well all thanks to ai we are it's less about information gathering and more about how do we really pioneer new ways of uh thinking how do we use these tools to better society mm -hmm. so having safe spaces where we could explore uh, these dialogues or these decision making without immediately them being implemented gives us the yeah the the space to make either mistakes which is totally necessary for us to figure out um yeah hmm. collectively the what is the direction right thank you david yeah, I, I'm going to now agree with what Jennifer's been saying. And um, I, I I think 
you know, when we look at play-based learning, I, the question was, what would a classroom look like? Mm -hmm. So I think a classroom would look like a lot of students, a lot of participants working with each other, interacting with each mm -hmm. other. It would be a shift away from the sage on the stage type model to where th people are doing things. They're exploring, they're trying things out, they're discussing things. And so it, it becomes much more of a student-centered classroom. I refer to myself as a learning facilitator rather than as a lecturer or a prof. You no, know, so I'm facilitating the environment within which the learning will happen. You will be doing the work. And mm -hmm. so you'll see the groups of students working together, figuring things out and learning in that process. And they may be playing you know, there may be play, but the fact that they are engaging with, possibly struggling with mat the material, mm -hmm. but that's where the learning is happening. And hopefully there is going to be play as part of that as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hop off on that one, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. I think the, the um, learner centricness is central. Because one of the things we know about play is you can't like force someone to do it, right? That was like me in eighth grade at like a dance, and it was like the worst, right? You're like totally clamped down, totally. You just can't do it. You need to enter into it. Um, it needs to be something that's chosen. And th in that way, in a lot of ways, play is just fundamentally incompatible with a lot of the goals of school, which have these external. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think the the thing in there is a playful facilitator, and I. Again, I'm not an expert in play. I, I study games, and they're related, obviously, but different. A, a playful facilitator, or in my case, a well-designed game, is always going to start with where someone's at, and from there, invite them in, right? And make it, and if it's successful, what's going to happen is that someone could be really uninterested or really checked out, or I think as we're seeing today, we've got a lot of kids that enter a classroom and saying, I hate science, I hate math, or I'm bad at coding, because that's how, you know, that's the identity they're even coming in with. And a, a well-designed game is going to give them an opportunity to be that kid, you know, to, to hate math. Like, okay, fine, you hate math. And we even write characters like that, that, that do that. And instead of even trying to flip it over and, you know, convince them they like math, <laughs> instead we, sh we try to invite them into this place of, you know, having their efforts driven by curiosity and wonder um, towards something else, right? So we set up scenarios and stories and environments where all of a sudden math is the best way to get from here to there, that thing you want. Um, the, I think another thing that is fundamental to play is the idea of mediated failure. So if you watch two dogs play together, you know, there aren't injuries, but all of the similar actions are getting, you know, motioned out. So in in the case of a game, what's interesting about that is failure becomes an integral part of the learning process. So we design for failure in such ways that it's it's literally fun to play, like or fun to fail. And by doing so, you're iterating on a loop of meaning making, right? You're you're trying a thing out. You've got a mental model of how this thing works. You try that out. You epically fail, and then you adjust your model and you try it again. And that whole process is celebrated. Um, the last one I think I'll, I'll mention here is the idea of the magic circle. And this really kind of comes back to storytelling and identity, where in a well-designed game, there's going to be the ability to put on a costume, to be someone else, to leave yourself behind for a couple minutes, to be a, you know, a rock star, literally, in some games, um, and, and just put on that costume for a little bit and play along with, with that identity and see what that feels like. Um, and then take it off and know that we're not trying to tell, like, we're not trying to change you, but, you know, as we look at the scholarship, we find out that does change people when they get to try on different identities. Um, and that whole thing, I think, serves maybe the deepest goal that I think we've really nailed a design when we've allowed people to think things they couldn't have thought before. Mm. They really would have had an emotional block or have not been able to go somewhere. Um, we actually create these spaces where the unthinkable can happen. Um, and there's a lot of directions to go with that, given that we all are like existentialists around here. But um, <laughs> that, that's where we really nailed it. <laughs> so, I, I want to just riff off something that you said, David, about around failure. 
because in the school system and the education system, we don't teach people how to fail. Mm. You know, if, if you go, you know, we don't say, okay, we're going to fail and students go, don't go home and go, I failed really good today. No, that doesn't mm. happen. But games provides that space, that safe space for failure to happen. And we, we really need to be um, teaching, you know, infusing within um, students that failure is not an end point. Failure is a stepping stone, a necessary stepping stone to success. And, you know, games, the play provides us with that safe space for them to really grapple with, okay, it didn't work. Now what do I do? That iteration that David talked about, how we can mm. build, learn from, build on what just happened. Can I say one more thing on that? Okay, because okay. I noticed one of the other funny things we talk about building playful teams um, so we hire folks like um, musicians, UI designers, UX designers, you know, illustrators, and it, that loop of failure, it's so hard to teach. <laughs> I find people coming from the professional world in any of those fields, because, you know, some of even one of our best UX designers, I mean, he's brilliant, but he's got this thing of like, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it all hidden, keep it all hidden, keep it all hidden. And then there's going to be a big reveal. And I want everybody to clap and have it be perfect the first time. So it's like anybody that joins our team, like has to have that dismantled immediately where mm. it's like, no, you're going to demo work in progress. Like you're going to, it's going to suck. Everybody knows it's going to suck, <laughs> but you know, we're, we're going to iterate through a thing. Um, and I think games do this really well with students because assessment and performance are completely intermeshed. Like everything you do is assessed in a game at, at the millisecond time scale. Um, and then I really love if we can bring those those lessons into our teams as well and, you know, reduce that latency for assessment where it's like we're always getting feedback on our work and the kind of feedback is scaling with how mature the work is. So by the time it's really mature, then we're maybe testing and deploying to audiences and such. But right up front, it's like we're all standing around a whiteboard that didn't cost anything to draw on. And we're arguing about that and crossing each other's stuff out. So it's, I think games give us this lesson of like mediated failure, it, low latency assessment, integrated assessment with performance um, that often don't get, you know, it, there's very few environments that do that naturally. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, thank you. So, thank you very much. I'm going to pull a, a thread from what you just said, David, and um, I'm going to pause for a second here, give everyone in the room the opportunity to plot questions in the chat, gather your thoughts, reflect a bit on what you've heard so far, link it to your craft, your work, and see if there's anything that you would like to pick our, our uh, speaker's brains um, going forward. And I'll go first, because there's so much you just, it's, it's very hard to sell play. We're still in that as consultants, learning experience designers, even in-house, I worked as a learning and development manager, it was really hard to put a more playful approach to, to anything forward. Because there you are faced with all of these varying grained um, expectations or fears often, uh, will I be judged? Um, I'm not perfect. I can't fail. I, my manager shouldn't see me failing. Um, the big uh, reveal of something that I've been working on and everyone applauds me. Like those are all things that we're carrying and, and we all have those. So I wonder, David uh, Gagnon, you, you're, you're doing also a lot of research, like you're looking at a lot of data. So I wonder if there are a couple of data uh, backed insights that we could all use in our arguments whenever we have to, whenever we're met with um let's say a whenever we're met with a blockage when whenever it comes to learning uh, whether that's like our own manager clients we're working with etc uh, usually they say it's it's playful we don't do games here this is serious work this is important we're managing money this is work we're not going to play games um and that's when that comes our way is there anything in terms of research data that we can pull and be like well actually if we do this and we take this leap of faith this is where our team our work our creativity results will, will get 
Uh, so, okay, I'm a researcher again, so my brain <laughs> starts going here. But um, there's two ways to approach that, right? There's the theoretical argument, and then there's the empirical argument. Mm -hmm. um, from a, th I'll, I'll be careful with the theoretical argument, but you know, the folks like Jim G in 2010, um, you know, what video games have to teach us about learning and literacy, or Constance Steinkuhler's work studying how kids interacted in a large multiplayer video games and um, self-organized into teams that were training each other, building mathematical models. Um, you know, fourth graders that are like expert managers of like 300 kids with like sub managers, right? Um, so there, there's a lot of examples, both from like a learning science standpoint, things like situated learning, things like Jim G's work with literacy, Constance, Kurt Squire, you know, I can go on and on like this and feel free to reach out for literature that show games as kind of an, a perfect learning environment, right? Because theoretically they're, they're situating someone in a real life context of some sort and it's action based. So you're not answering multiple check, you know, choice questions. You're doing something, you're getting a feedback, like we mentioned before in the domain that's happening, right? So you're in a music game, you're rewarded with music, you know, in a, in a game about journalism, you're rewarded with a good story and, and the impact that it has on society, right? So the feedback loop is in the domain of the practice and you're picking up not only the, the content or the knowledge of the practice, but you're picking up what David Schaefer calls an epistemic frame. You're picking up the discourses, practices, vocabulary, values, tools, you know, you're picking up the, literally the, Again, I'm, I don't mean to geek out on theory, but um, the activity system that, that exists within that domain. So from a, a theoretical point, games are a, I mean, you can't think of a better, more scalable way to teach, right? Uh, there, I'll put a caveat up and say, we don't do training games personally. I'm just really not interested in them. You know, if, if the task is already well-defined and you're just trying to teach someone how to pull a crank, you know, we're out. <laughs> but when we're getting into these bigger questions of like, why would someone pull a crank and what impact does that have on history? Now I'm now I'm in again, right? The domain, the practices of science, the practices of journalism. Um, okay, just to caveat that, because there's a lot of people that'll sell you a, a training that's cheaper and better than the thing you're already doing. Um, but then from an empirical standpoint, I think it's really interesting to look at um, like Doug Clark et al. 2014 that did a, a meta study of uh, thousands of other articles that evaluated different components of games and game-based learning and empirically concluded games are a very effective form of education um, across context, across age group, across subject. Um, and he's not the only one, um, but that wasn't the only team. So we have empirical evidence, I think, that would statistically say this is this is a good move. Like th from a every way that we can slice it to measure it and measure its efficacy, um, it, it's it's a done deal. No one's debating that anymore. Like no one's saying our game's good anymore. Like don't that that was settled, you know, at least well ten years ago. Um, now the question has moved on, at least for researchers, into how and why and when we know narrative is good or we know situated learning is good or we know, you know, we're trying to figure out like, well, what are the attributes of that? And, and how do we get better at that? But no one's even asking the question anymore. Like, is it good? Is it effective? Like we're, mm. we're done, um, at least in the research community. Mm. If you can share some of those uh, articles you've mentioned, uh, if you can share them, it doesn't have to be now in the chat later on so we can pack them in the, in the recap, that would be awesome. And this allows me to open up and surface a question that Brenda has. We're like, okay, we know that games are good. We know that they're great for learning. Um, we're now looking into the why and how, and we have also practitioners in the room. So it's very interesting to surface your question. What elements of games do you consider essential to create an educational game? as motivate, a, a motivating and an entertain, entertaining game. So what are elements, key components that games have that we can bring in learning experiences to emulate that engaging, stimulating environment? Um, and feel free to take it away if you, if you have something to add.
can certainly go on this one again. Um, just kind of. <laughs> It's uh, it's the ball is uh, the ball is <laughs> in the air. Whoever catches the ball uh, gets Fair to kick enough. it. So I'll I'll continue to subdivide it. We don't do I know it's kind of negative, but it's like we don't do training games, and that's the kind of game that you can do. We don't do gamification, where you mm -hmm. again separate the the form of feedback from the domain of practice. You know, you reward brushing your teeth with gold stars or something. We don't really do that. Um, but the games that I you know, work on are really ones that are really tied into, uh, well, a situated social cultural view of the world, right? So it's people doing things together. And what that often means is that we're looking at um, professional practices as an inspiring center point, right? So there's like one gateway into the, into some of the games we make. So we recently made a game about journalism. And, you know, we, we think we were looking at the ways that, you know, uh, you could teach that. And, you know, we, we're, we started with, well, what did journalists do, right? So we like assemble a panel of journalists. <laughs> we're like, what do you do? What challenges do you run into? Like, what are the resources that are limited in your world? And we interviewed them and really picked out what their epistemic frame was. Like, what world do you work in? What are the skills that make a journalist successful? Um, and we just start to translate that as much as we can into things that kids can do. Uh, we look at scientists and uh, like we work with the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, which is the most abstract thing you could imagine. They're on the South Pole. They have a telescope that looks in every direction at once. They're doing astrophysics. They're doing fundamental science. And when you ask mm -hmm. them what they do, they respond with math. Um, and you're like, but why does it matter? And you start asking, you know, how these different scientists got into this field. And they turn into children, like right in front of you. You see their eyes get wide. And they start talking about just how um, existential literally it would be to come into conflict or come in, into view of a, of a neutron star or a black hole. And they're talking about how they're looking back in time and they're looking at the most fundamentally interesting objects in the universe. And you start going in on that, right? You're like, oh, so this is how someone becomes mm -hmm. an astrophysicist. And you, 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 you go into that emotion of that thing. Like, what are you going for, right? So while the journalists are saying, we want to see democracy go forward, we're talking about making democratic society, the scientists are saying, you know, we're running eyes wide open at the most wondrous objects in the world, you know, or we talk to the life sciences like we did with Wake, and you're seeing these delicate balances of ecosystems and, you know, how they're so curious to discover new species and see how fragile these things are and special they are and to be able to describe those things mathematically. And then their general love of exploration, of travel, of being in international situations and collaborating with people. And you, you capture all of that, right? So that's what goes into making a game, um, or at least the way we make games. All of that same stuff can work in a classroom environment or some other environment. It's like you just have to peel back a layer and say, why does it, like, why do the people that have given their life to this, why they do it? Like, what's interesting about this? What's the end game? of this. Mm. And as soon as you get into that mode, it transforms how you think about any of the domains. You don't talk about history as dates and facts. You talk about people uncovering lost stories and trying to understand conflicting evidence. Um, you're talking about science in some of the ways I'm explaining. And mathematics is these tools that allow us to do things that couldn't be done before. Um, and it's even in the little details, like the cryogenic engineers that we work with, that just celebrate it when stuff exploded. <laughs> you know, you set up some, it's like part of the fun of the job is you like build all this stuff and you go into the lab and then it like catches on fire. And like, those are the highlights of, of their learning process. So you build that into the, you know, you, you try to create mediated versions of those mm -hmm. experiences to capture the entire epistemic frame. And teachers do it. You know, we see teachers that are able to do that. Um, my favorite story is we hear uh, that, teachers that have picked up the phrase, what would Joe do? Kind of a riff on, you know, the what would Jesus do? Uh, arm but Joe Wilder is a character in our fourth grade history inquiry game. And she's always trying to corroborate evidence. Um, and she's always like looking for more artifacts that help explain these things. So you've got a whole group of fourth graders now that when they're encountering a chapter in a history book, you know, the prompt that came out of their community was what would Joe do? And what Joe would do is go look for other evidence, go get interviews, look at archival, you know. So it's neat when you see those practices making their whole way through, you know, to kids. Mm. 
So I have context relevant, emotion, curiosity. What's interesting about this storytelling, personal meaning, common language, Jennifer, David Newman, why are you throwing in the mix of elements that games, that are essential for games in teaching, learning, experience design? I think I'll also riff off a little bit of what David was sharing um, about sort of about finding what motivates people to want to engage in this game in the first place, um, especially if you are going to spend time in developing games with a learning outcome, like uh, spend the time in investigating why, what, like, it's the, the game needs to be the perfect challenge of, uh, well, it needs to be challenging enough actually to be entertaining. So the defining what makes the challenge meaningful to the group of people you're designing the game for uh, would be a really great starting point because some people want to fail and um, be competitive. Some people really want to collaborate and to um, explore without uh, an immediate goal. So learning about the audience you're creating for. And I think I wanna give a pretty extreme example. Lately I've been, uh, I've attended a training in educational LARP, uh, which is live action role-playing. And in the domain of LARP, there is a Nordic LARP, which is, this uh which is a genre well developed from the nordic countries but they really go heavy into uh some of the heavy topics like war or rape or uh, genocide like these you know and people go to these uh events or, or uh, join these larp experiences and that is still considered play so really understanding what yeah, what makes the challenge meaningful for your participant? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. I think one of the elements that both David and what Jennifer was talking about with Flower is that it creates an environment of psychological safety where it's safe to explore these ideas, whether it's war or no, what, what, whatever it is you're doing. And this, um, there was a study in Google where they're looking at what, what is it that creates the high performing teams. And one of the things that came out of that was there's psychological safety within the team, there, that there is the safety to be able to try things out to fail. And that is an important element of the play-based learning where you can try these things out and it's okay if it doesn't work out, you learn from that. Um, and and I, I do this, um, you were talking about role playing. I do this with a media history game that I've created around you know, the, the formation of public broadcasting in Canada. Now, for most you know, the students come in, and these aren't history students. Most of the students I have coming through the course, interestingly, are taking it as an elective in the summer, you know, thinking this is going to be an easy course, and they find it's actually something quite different. But they go in deep to understand the different stakeholders around the whole debate that took place around, you know, what do we do to compete against these huge radio stations in the US who are basically swamping the radio system in Canada? And, you know, what kind of radio system do we want? And so they're able to actually go into those roles and it doesn't them, you know, it's something external to them. So it, it's safe, but there's a lot of learning that happens in their exploration. So I think to be able to step out of themselves as a person and to be able to experiment and try things in a safe environment, it, it's part of what makes the games and the get play based learning so, so successful. Mm. Thank you. Tash has a great question. Tash, do you want to come off mute and ask the question? Otherwise, I can just surface it myself. Sure, I can do that. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Amazing. Um, I'll also come off video so that I'm not just a cartoon head speaking. Um, there we go. You're spotlighted as well, so we can all amazing. see you now. Thank Yay. you. 
Hi, folks. Thank you so much for, for everything that you've shared with us so far. Um, it's been incredibly enlightening. Um, I have I come from more of a strategy design consulting background. And so a lot of the time I'm trying to introduce elements of play in the boardroom, so to speak. So my question was, how do you frame learning through collaborative play to a adults who, you know, think work is for work and play is for not work? Um, so these like traditionally business minded folks, are there tools, languages, like frameworks, research that you use to try to, you know, um, articulate the value of it and, and also to carry them through that journey? Um, and are there any elements of play design that you consider more appropriate for this sort of, I've called a playground? Thanks. Have you come across Lego Serious Play, Tash? Yes, yes, I have. No, I think that's a wonderful example of what you know, where you can be used in play in you know, the boardrooms and strategic uh, role. And it's understanding, it's maybe giving the, the group a little bit of understanding of what's actually happening when you're working with Lego blocks, that you're working with metaphors, that you're doing story, you're providing an e equal space for everyone. But it's also what, what's happening in the brain. Because what we are trying to talk about, sometimes we can't find the right words, the right ideas, but if we're physically playing with objects, and it doesn't have to be Lego bricks, so it can be you know, other physical things you're doing where you're, you're recreating it. It enables ideas to emerge that you may not otherwise be able to articulate and to be able to start making sense of those ideas outside of just the verbal you know, thinking, speaking side. So I think that that's one of the things of saying, we're using these as a tool. It doesn't that you're playing with Lego, it's that the Lego is a tool to help uncover these other ideas. Now, they're, they're, it's a metaphor, you know, you're creating metaphors. And so helping them to go beyond that. But to be honest, a lot of people just love to play with Lego anyway. This is sort of you're tapping into this inner child that they remember that, you know, back all those years ago where they were used to play with this. So they may not want to admit to that, but it's actually tapping into something that, um, you know, they've got a fond memory of. Yeah, part of me wants to say that I feel the landscape is changing a bit, um, that, that, maybe there is more assumption towards the business minded folks that they're not open to play than like assume more close mindedness than there really is mm -hmm. uh, through just this past decade of really design thinking and design sprints icebreakers workshop you know online collaboration platforms like i mean like butter you know there is this um i feel gradual open the openness that is already there uh that they might not even think of it as play but i mean a lot of icebreakers you know they come from drama games they come from like uh yeah game-based learning inspiration so maybe if you feel that there's too big of a of a, of a leap really just have them experience it and then retrospectively explain, you know, that was actually a game. And uh, it's like, oh, you've already done it. And rather than like, can you get them to buy in? Because I feel like everyone's open to, okay, let's give this thing a try, five, 10, 15 minutes, like finding something that's a bit of on the low threshold side that makes sense, right? It makes sense for you, um, for the value that you want to bring. Um, yeah, so looking up some methods that could work for your context. What uh, what I've done, Tash, is I often say, I often invite folks for an experiment. Who's willing to do an experiment? Who's willing to experiment something with me? Because an experiment is also you have this idea that it can fail. We don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of curiosity around it, etc. So that usually opens people up. And, yeah. and actually, the experiment's a game. And, and then we experiment with it. Um, is your question answered, Tash? Anything you'd like to add here? No, that's, that's lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking. All right, let's see what else do we have in the chat. Um, Liz, 
do you want to come off mute and share your question if you're still with us yes i see you here otherwise i surface it no worries can everyone hear me yes yes okay great um yes um i really liked the definition that david g you shared um, and some of those game elements that we've talked about so context relevant storytelling it feels to me very similar to also how we might define practice and immersive kind of spaces for people to um, practice safely and fail safely I'd be interested to know whether the panel think there is a difference between practice and games and play or actually whether we should all be talking about the same thing. I mean, I think I'll respond to that um, with frameworks. <laughs> so come at it and try to generalize a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how old I am at this point, but I had a Palm Pilot right when they came out. It was like the precursor to the precursor to the iPhone, right? And it had this stupid language where to to like write on it, you had to like use their alternate alphabet. And they had a game that basically was like the letters would come down, like, and you had to like write them before they hit the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is like gamification at its finest, right? Mm -hmm. It was a reward system, bading bading. Yeah, you win by doing a totally different activity. And it was highly effective, right? So they, so I'm, I would never mock the effectiveness of gamification. It's super effective. It's just reptile brain level training, right? Um, so you could think of gamifying practice. That's a thing. You can do that. It's really effective. <laughs> but as you keep moving along a continuum and you're trying to move someone into more and more complicated stuff, like whatever it is, um, there's going to be a threshold where you hit simulation. And I, that'll just happen, I think, in any of this. You're going to be simulating some environment um, where the role of play is the methods in which you've structured interaction with that simulation, right? So the, the playfulness then is the what does success look like? What are the challenges? And now we've opened up this world of design. So now we're designing like heavy duty design because you're saying, what is the pacing for that? Like how quickly are the challenges escalating? What are the assessments? You know, how are we interacting with that simulation? And I think that like is like a rocket taking off of like when you're designing learning experiences um, where practice is certainly an element of them, um, but the parts at least in a game that, that, that kind of wrap around practice are practice towards what, using what tools, what are the individual challenges, how are we escalating the complexity of this thing. Um, and again, all of our work starts at simulation forward. Um, and I would kind of theoretically argue that a game is always a simulation with some wrapper of goal systems around it and structure around it. Um, so a game is always simulation plus. But practice is, is like, in my mind, it's, a, it's one of the Legos, it's one of the, the bricks that build up a game. Mm. Liz, how does that sound? Uh, that makes so much sense. My brain is exploding at the same time, but uh, <laughs> that's a really helpful um, distinction. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the question, Liz. I have one more question here from Alexandra. Alexandra, are you in the room? Any other questions? Yes, Alok, great discussion so far. My question is, do you want to come off mute and share your question, Alok? Sure, sure. Yes. Uh, you, can, you can hear me, right? Just quickly. We can. Me. Yeah. Okay. So once again, hi, everyone. Uh, this is me, I'm Alok. And uh, so I, I am a, a corporate workshop facilitator. And my question is coming from that context. If, uh, if you can please help me understand. So we do uh, games as a part of learning, of course. Let's say for a recent conflict management workshop, of course, there were games that I played around trust, around empathy, around active listening, and all of that. I'm, I'm sure you understand. But what I'm also now trying to see is that is there a way that I can think like a game designer and tie in all these activities in a way that they don't come across as a set of activities for each subtopic? I mean, I'm okay with, say, one 
activity per topic kind of a scenario and that's usually the way i've seen most of the workshops run but from your uh, understanding and your all intelligence is there a way i can think of a complete full day workshop which is more or less a cohesive game in which the activities fall in parts but it's all leading into a big uh, you know uh, eureka moment kind of a scenario is that possible i'm sure you do that in some way but in my context is that possible i've got a really short answer for that from experience which is yes but at exponential cost exponential mm -hmm. design cost so we can make a 20 minute game for a tenth of what we're going to make a you know a game that's going to have five modules like that that cohesively connect together mm -hmm. so it the i find that because their system is getting bigger and it's going to get exponentially bigger every time you add a new node to a system so it, it, so yes but it's going to be harder a lot harder yeah I, i'm going to say yes as well but i'm no, I'm not looking at it from the point of view of, of video games and modules. I'm looking yeah, at yeah. Your My question was also in the overall context of experiential. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's looking at, okay, what is, you know, having a theme, an idea, a situation, looking at that whole workshop within this bigger um, narrative. Like one big game, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you, you want to have a narrative that's going through the workshop. And so figuring out what is that bigger narrative and then developing within those different stages, those different activities that fit as part of a narrative. And it might be it's a, you know, they're on a, some kind of quest and they need to discover things. Um, so, yes, I, I think it is possible. It does take more time to, yeah. to think and develop. And it's one of those things where, you know, over time, as you do these workshops and you're starting to build them, then you can build on them. But um, mm -hmm. I would say absolutely yes. Now, I do that in a way with my media history class where you we're know, working with the role playing game. They are working on this is something that takes place over six weeks where we're looking mm -hmm. at different elements over six weeks. They're role playing within the, you know, the night, these parliamentary hearings but there are different things that are happening over that process. So absolutely, that is the case. Now, it's probably, it's a little bit outside of what you're doing, but if you have a look, um, Barnard College reacting to the past, you know, this pedagogy where we're creating these games for classes, you know, secondary school, university, and they are around these big stories, these big areas, narratives, and they're looking into different ideas you might be able to take some of the ideas there and think okay how can i transform that into a corporate situation there's um there's also a game maker in spain and i can't think of the name of it where they're creating these kinds of corporate games so okay. absolutely possible sure thank you thank you thank you so if much. you can if, if you can pop you. that reference david in the chat would much yeah. appreciate it uh, Alo, is that is that bringing you a step forward to in your exploration? Thank you so much, David and David. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the Thank question. Uh, I'm left with uh, more questions than uh, the beginning of the. Uh, we haven't even touched anything related to you know how do we assess the effectiveness of games? That's like a spicy topic. How do we know they work? Um, but we're at time and I want to leave everyone with a bit of a, a bit of a reflection, I invite everyone in the room. Um, and this is just a poll, an open-ended poll where you can type in your answers and then click submit. What is one insight that stuck with you from this whole conversation? Lots of questions, impressions, thoughts. What is one thing that really stuck with you? And I'll put in some ref some nice slow tunes in the back. Uh, feel free to also use the chat if you want to. And one question here is, uh, who is the superhero that took notes in the shared notes? Show yourself, wiggle a finger. Who was that person? 
Steffi, was that you? Or you have a comment? <laughs> You've got the mic. Oh yeah, that, that was me. <laughs> Yay! Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, Steffi. Course, I'll add more. Yay, cool. We can use that for the event recap. So here's what we see. Play shortens the gap in knowledge and implementation. It's going to suck, but we'll iterate through it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Playfulness means very different things to different people. What would Joe do? The continuing benefits of play and its potential for continued growth. I really enjoyed the peepiness of Jennifer's statement, play shortens the gap between knowledge and implementation. All right, keep them coming. I want to take the time to thank David, David and Jennifer for being with us today, for waking up so early. David Newman, thank you very much. We appreciate it for putting up with all of our questions and brain picks. This was awesome. Thank you very much. And to everyone who joined us and uh, took an hour of your time with your attention and your presence to be with us today. Much appreciation. I will drop a link to the list of the playground sessions in the chat in case you want to explore the further workshops. It was an absolute pleasure as usual. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you very soon in this uh, online world. Thank you very much. I love the